So Farrah Tanis is the co-founder and executive director of Black Women's Blueprint, a national black feminist organization in Brooklyn, New York. She also launched and chaired the first Truth and Reconciliation Commission in the US to focus on black women and sexual assault. Tanis is a 2012 US Human Rights Institute fellow. Over the past seven years, she has served as almoner for the Havens Relief Fund, was on the board of directors for Haki Yetsu working to end rape in the Congo region of Africa, and on the board of Right Rides, which provides safe rides home to women and LGBTQ people in New York City. Tanis is the founder of the Museum of Women's Resistance, which was recently recognized as a site of conscience by International Coalition of Sites of Conscience. She is the creator of Mother Tongue Monologues, a human rights theater production and multimedia vehicle for communicating black feminist praxis at the grassroots and addressing black sexual politics in African American communities. Her body of work also includes the production and contribution to several grassroots and international films, policy, and human rights curricula. Good morning, everyone. It is a pleasure to be here. Uh, you know, I, I'm just, um, I'm thrilled, I'm excited, I'm all of these things. I, I'm, I'm experiencing so many things right now, I can't really pinpoint, you know, what, what it is, but I'm welcoming all of the feelings. I love the energy in here, and I thank you for giving me the opportunity to speak with you today, and thank you, Ajim. You know, that's my, <laughs> my sister friend. So I want to start with a quote. And um, this quote is by Dr. Judith Herman, if any of you have read uh, um, Trauma in Recovery. And as stated by Dr. Judith Herman, whether or not they are visible, the wounds sustained in rape are as inevitable as gunshot and shrapnel wounds in warfare. The symptoms resemble that of combat response, like those experienced by men engaged directly in hand-to-hand -hand combat in war. This is just to really uh, uh, provide a frame for thinking about sexual assault and thinking about rape today and its impact, and thinking about it within the context of a war that just didn't begin today, but that started long, long ago when we talk about black women and we talk about African-American women. So the Black Women's Truth and Reconciliation Commission, which I'm about to talk about today, is the first of its kind, again, as, as was said, to focus on black women and their experiences with rape in the United States. An independent body led by civil society, it was launched by black feminists and womanists right here in the US and it is a bold, it is an innovative and groundbreaking move by black women across generations, ethnicities, sexualities, and other identities to confront the ever-shifting nature of rape culture and sexual violence against us in this country. The specific goals of this commission are to examine the history, context, causes, and consequences of rape on black women for the purpose of healing and transformation for survivors, to engage community in new and effective responses geared towards accountability through targeted, relevant organizing towards systemic change and advocacy on the particular laws and policies that continue till this day to encourage or contribute to the high incidences of rape against black women in their communities. Similar to other truth commissions, like the Greensboro um, Truth Commission, the Wakanabe Indian Tribal Government of Maine Truth Commission, and the Mississippi uh, Truth Commission, similar to those, our mandate is for truth, justice, healing, and reconciliation. Why a truth commission now? Why today? The United States is one of the few places in the world where mass rapes have occurred systematically against an entire race of people, African American women, and there has been no civil rights outcry, no processes for justice, no acknowledgement or recognition of such violations as they occurred in the past, and still little to no recourse to address the high rates of sexual assault on black women today. So let me give you a bit of historical context, because the past is ever 
present. The sexual exploitation of black women in this country, not everywhere, but in this country, has its roots in slavery, with the wholesale government-sanctioned rape of black women for various purposes for production or reproduction. Then when blacks tested their freedom during Reconstruction, former slaveholders and their sympathizers used rape as a weapon of terror to dominate the bodies and minds of black women and the rest of their communities. That history is real. It happened. It cannot be erased. We know it. It lives in us. It's been passed down from generation to generation, whether you lived in the United States or Haiti or Jamaica or wherever you're from, as black women. As is documented by Bell Hooks, Danielle McGuire, Deborah Gray White, and other historians, during Jim Crow, white men kidnapped and lured black women and girls away from home with promises of steady work and better wages. We're talking about the mammies, the domestic workers. Attack, these men attacked them on the job, abducted them at gunpoint while traveling to or from home, work or church, raped them as a form of retribution or to enforce the rules of racial and economic hierarchy, sexually humiliated and assaulted them on the streets, in streetcars, on buses, in taxicabs and trains, and in other public places. As our sister freedom fighter, Fannie Lou Hamer, put it, a Negro woman's body was never hers alone. This was less than a few decades ago. For many of our black grandmothers and our mothers who survived this era, who fled north during the Great Migration, which is reported to have lasted up until 1970, despite repression and silencing both inside and outside our communities, they still remember, they still live the impact, and they no longer wish to keep their stories secret. Today for us, my generation, and the generation after me, so our teens, not much has changed. Current statistics indicate that today black women are 35% more likely than their white counterparts to be victims of violence and account for a full third of intimate partner homicides, yet we comprise only 8% of the US population. The landscape has also changed for black women, as both statistically and according to anecdotal reports, approximately 80 to 90% of sexual assaults that occur today are intra-racial. So it is happening in our communities, it is by those we love, by those we protect, and those with whom we live, which complicates the story. So I'm not gonna go too much through you know, the, 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 the stats, and I wanna talk a little bit more about uh, uh, you know, the actual truth commission, but there are some important things that we need to know about what's happening uh, in terms of sexual assault today. So according to the National Intimate Partner and Sexual Violence Survey in 2010, done by the CDC, black women experience rate at a rate of 22% higher than white women. I said that, okay, where sexual assault is concerned, while it's standard knowledge that 70% go underreported, it is also reported, the, the fact is that for every, for, for every white woman that reports a sexual assault, five do not. And statistics show that for every black woman that reports a sexual assault or breaks her silence, 15 do not. We remain silent for very legitimate reasons. We're talking about the intersections. Mainly we cannot report to a criminal justice system which has its roots in slave patrols and white supremacy. We cannot report to a criminal justice system that employs racist tactics like stops and frisk when we talk about New York City and other places in America. We cannot report to a criminal justice system which continues to just sweep up our brothers and sons and lock them up before they can reach their 25th birthday or younger. So today when we look at the intersections, we also know that for black women seeking justice, whether through grassroots restorative processes or if a survivor so chooses, through the legal system, we face a relatively more difficult time seeking those resources due to gender, due to race, sexuality, gender expression, economic and other status. For black women, sexual stereotypes and sexual representations force us to navigate in a system that shames us and shapes our experiences as victims. So our contemporary accounts, recent accounts, still reveal that there is a lack of justice when we do choose to seek justice, namely the rights of crime victims against racial and sexual discrimination in the courts and in the, and in the legal justice um, system. There are drastic disparities for the attainment of justice. 
one more intersectional issue. There's the link to poverty, which cannot be understated. Research shows an undeniable and complex and often cyclical connection between violence against black communities and black women and poverty where women is concerned, where women are concerned. A rape or multiple rapes can jeopardize women's economic, uh, I know I'm feeling so, ah, I keep getting these, this sign, I'm sorry, I get distracted. Um, uh, it, 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 violence against women, black communities, and poverty with violence against women. A rape or multiple rapes can jeopardize women's economic well-being, often leading to homelessness, unemployment, and conversely, poverty. Living in poverty, unsafe housing, insecurity, increases the risk for sexual violence. And so there is a natural connection and a natural link that should be made between those working on the issue of criminal justice reform, community accountability, and anti-poverty work. We see these things as part of the primary prevention that needs to occur. The human rights at, at, at concern right now, and this is the last thing I will say because I think I have only 30 seconds, is Article 2, 3, and 25 of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, which ensures non-discrimination, personal security, and economic security as basic rights. So there is a critical need for the public process offered by truth commissions, combining participatory research, documentation of our lived experiences, providing victims a public platform, holding harm doers accountable, strengthening the rule of law, effectuating institutional and systemic reform, and promoting economic justice and criminal justice reform policy. Thank you.